I'm a pastor. I've been pastoring where I am now for 34 years, and I've been in the ministry now over 40, but I'm not bragging about it. I'm just trying to say that, that my messages, they may sound uh, hard and harsh and rough and tough and hard to bluff, but really they're not. I mean, it's just your religion is soft, that's all. And if, if, you, if you really would care about being helped, I'll help you. But if, you, if you're not interested in being helped, you want to be a sloppy, inconsistent, good-for-nothing, fruitless Christian, well then, uh, just remain like you are. Amen. But I could help you, and I, I feel like I'm not an authority by any means. And after you've heard all this good preaching this week, I'm sure that you'll recognize that I am not an authority. But... I, I tell you, I, am, I have a burden on my heart and my ministry. Everybody carries a burden that preaches. If you don't carry a burden, you can't hardly preach. You've got to have convictions, but you've got to have a burden. You've got to try to get a message across to somebody. And, and now, I, I got saved when I was a little boy, nine years of age. And so... I really wasn't saved out of a life of wicked sin like a lot of folks were. I, I can't give some glowing testimony that I was a drug addict or a drunk. I've never tasted a, a beer in my life or whiskey's never come to my lips and I never messed with those drugs and I, of course, I, I just never smoked and all those things. I was brought up in a godly Christian home and, and that's, but all I've ever known is the Lord and uh, things of God. But uh, well, when I was a young man, I felt God's call into the ministry just when I was about 16. I surrendered to preach. Then I went away to Bible school when I was 18 and I graduated from seminary and uh, took a church and um, pastored that little church for four years and those four years were like the dark ages of my life i i didn't know anything about the power of god on my life i i went to a good bible school i thought the best one there was in the country at that time i was it was the bible baptist seminary of fort worth texas dr j frank norris as the president and uh, and Dr. Lewis Insminger, probably one of the greatest Bible teachers and Sunday school men. I, I had good training, and I'm not complaining about it, but the emphasis was not laid upon at all upon having the power of the Holy Ghost on your life. The, the emphasis was laid on building a church and winning souls, and that's nothing wrong with that. And I appreciated that part of my ministry, but I've been... First, are you listening? First part of my ministry, I just struggled, just struggled and cried. And I didn't know what was wrong. I couldn't preach my way out of a wet paper sack. I just couldn't get, I just couldn't get anything going, really. Once in a while, I might wax eloquent, but not very many times. And I would just get so frustrated, my mind would just tore up on the inside of me. And then I went away and took, a, took another work in Florida and was there and, and heard some old-fashioned preaching and power of God was on those services. And I got, I got interested in getting in where others were in and I wanted something that they had in my life. I'd been saved ever since I was a little boy. I'd been brought up in church and pastored a church and been assistant pastor a couple of hitches once with my father and another with that people in Florida and I said I want God on my life and and I was willing to pay whatever price I had to pay to, to get the power of God and when God saw that I meant business well he meant business with me and one day I've said this many times but this is my testimony and one day in the living room of my home I, I got down and I got a hold of God and I finally took my hands off from my life and surrendered and gave up those lustful, all the filth, all the wickedness, all of the carnality, all that was in my life that wasn't right with God. I confessed it and forsook it right there that day. And God filled me with the Holy Ghost that day in my, in the, in my living room of my house. And I was not, I was not uh, charismatic. I said I did not talk in tongues and I didn't swing from the chandelier nor did I jump over the Davenport but God did something for me that day when I got rid of all those weights that so did easily beset me. 
And I had to give them up. I had to cough them up, confess them, rip them out by the roots, and then God got a hold of my life and absolutely revolutionized and changed me. And for about 35 years now, God has blessed my life and my ministry. It wasn't but about a month or six weeks after I surrendered my life there. And that, some of you are fooling around. I wish you wouldn't. I say, I, that at that occasion, I surrendered my life. And within six weeks, I became pastor where I am now. Then there are 34 years, and it's been, I'm not trying to be super spiritual, but it's been like a Holy Ghost revival every Sunday, every service. Now, there's, I'm not trying to say I, anything special, but I took my hands off from my life and let God use me. And I'm saying if you'd ever get around to doing such a thing, you can find what I found. It's just for anybody that'll pay the price. Amen. That's what I'm trying to say today. I'd like to take you to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2 for a text tonight. This morning, I will spring from it, probably not return to it too much, but it's a text. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Lord, anoint thy servant for the occasion. I promise you, Lord, I'll not touch the glory. You can have it all. Please loose me and let me preach. In Jesus' name, amen. He said, let us lay aside every weight. Now, I don't know all the connotations but it appears that Paul is talking somewhat in the uh, line of an arena and a race that's being, a foot race that's being run. And he talks about the weights. He talks about the race. He talks about the cloud of witnesses. He didn't say crowd of witnesses. He said a cloud. Now, if it was a crowd of witnesses or a spectators in a coliseum, that was one thing. But our our cloud is higher than the crowd. The, you know, the clouds are higher than the crowd, but our, our crowd of witnesses are in heaven. And I kind of like to believe that those that have run the race before us are sitting in the galleries and watching us run the race. And uh, I'm sure that the judge is sitting there too, the one we are looking unto, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. He speaks here in this uh, particular uh, chapter about uh, uh, this uh, laying aside of all these weights. I'm sure that you know pretty well where I'm, what I'm going to say, but it is important to train to run the race. And uh, they use weights. They put them around their ankles. A lot of these boys sitting here, they have weights that they put on their ankles and they run with those weights that builds up their legs. But also when you take those weights off, after you run with the weights, your feet feel as light as can be and you could really run the race. Now I've never been a runner. I'm built for comfort rather than speed. But I've watched others run. Amen. But anything that would hinder, he said, lay them weights aside Anything that would hinder us from being victorious and from uh, winning the race and obtaining the crown that's laid up for us. Now we're going to talk about some of these weights this morning. Uh, that weight, of, and I'm going to use my, the word W-E-I-G-H-T-S and those letters as guidelines, make an acrostic, and I'll preach from that. I've got to have guidelines. My I wish I could preach like Brother Melody, just haul off and preach. Uh, he doesn't use any notes, and uh, that's great. I admire him, but I am that's not been my style, and I wish it was, but uh, that's you'll just have to put up with mine, and I trust that it'll give you something that you can take home and maybe preach in your own pulpit. 
Let me touch on God again. Father, I, I just can't do this by myself. And if I'm trying to do it for myself or any kind of, I just plead the blood. God, pray you'd cleanse and give us, God, just exactly what we need to say now. In Jesus' name, amen. I like to say the first weight starts with a W and it's worldliness. That's a weight that would so be, that would beset us from running the race. We're commanded by the Word of God that we are to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, uh, but of the world. And the... Of course, the end result is that the, earth, the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And John said there are two things we're not to love. We're not to love this world or the world or the things that are in the world. When he speaks about this world, he's speaking about this present evil world system. He's not talking about the earth. He's not talking about the grass and the trees and the brooks and the streams. We can enjoy those kind of... That's, that's earthly things. But he's speaking about the world. He's speaking about this evil world system this, that's under Satan's authority, that's run by unbelievers and most of them hell-bound idiots. And the principal force of this world is greed and selfishness and ambition and pleasure. And it may appear the world might appear outwardly religious and cultured and eloquent, but it's seething on the inside with commercial rivalry and um, ambition. And it's dominated by satanic principles. And the enemy, of course of God is the world. The world is the enemy of God the Father. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. I say again, the, the world is the enemy of God the Father. The flesh is the enemy of God the Holy Spirit. And the devil is the arch enemy of Jesus Christ. But when you love the world, you are flirting with the enemy of God. And the things that are in the world are the second thing. We're not to love this world system, nor are we to love those things that are in this world. Now, when I speak about the things, I'm speaking about worldly pleasures. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life. When I speak of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, this old flesh is so depraved. It's so corrupt. This, this flesh just craves this world. This flesh was made out of earth. Yes, sir. It's an earthling. It, this world will never, this flesh will never leave this world. It's here in this place. Your flesh is so deceptive. It is so defiling. It is so defiant and stubborn. It is so determined to control your life. It is so destructive to you. It is so demanding of your attention. And it's so damning. Amen. Amen. This world is a weight. Yes, it yes. works against all the spirituality. The world and the outside trying to make its overtures to you and the flesh on the inside warring against the Spirit of God. Yes, Your flesh, whether you realize it or not, is rotten to the core. Yes, Your flesh is so unfaithful, it has no conscience whatsoever. Your flesh is so unpredictable, you can't trust it. 
Your flesh is so unreliable. God said, put no confidence in it. Your flesh is so unscrupulous that it, I'm saying your flesh is so unscrupulous that it would do anything. Yes, sir. You, you just say, no, not me. I'm saying you could do anything. A lot of you folks said, I thought I'd never do such a thing as that. But you did it. Because your flesh is unscrupulous. It's so unmerciful. It's almost like a brute beast at times. It's so uncontrollable at times that I imagine I could go over, I could go over to your house. And I believe I could go to a bathroom door or a bedroom door. I believe I could find a hole in the bottom of some door where somebody got so mad and kicked the bottom of that door because somebody locked the door on them. No flesh just gets so... I could take you to a house in Lansing where a woman, well, a man shot at his wife and the whole uh, bullet hole still in the wall. Man of professing Christian, that's what he said. He said, well, I wouldn't think a man could have... Oh, listen, you don't know how rotten, the, the, the debauchable your rotten flesh is. It's rotten. So uncontrollable at times. So ungodly, your flesh, your flesh absolutely hates God. Oh, you say, no, it doesn't. Oh, yes, it does. The Bible said it's enmity against God. That means it's the enemy of God. Your flesh is so weak. It is so wicked. It is so wild. So wanton. That means it's loose and lascivious. It's so wavering, vacillating, deviating, fluctuating. One day you're up, next day you're down. It's so wayward. It's so worldly. It pertains to this world. It's made out of the dust of this world. It craves its pleasures. It craves it affairs. Yes, it does. Yes, amen. It, this old flesh craves human lust. This world is a weight. Your old flesh will rob you. It will rob you of your peace with God. It will rob you of your position with God. It will rob you of your privileges with God. It will rob you of your power with God. It will rob you of your profit. It profiteth nothing, the Bible says. It will rob you of your purity. It will rob you of your possibilities of doing what you want to do for God. I say, there are, the Bible said there are two things about the world. We're not to love the world system nor are we to love those things that are in the world. He said that uh, the lust of the flesh. And then he talked about the lust of the eye. I tell you, there are plenty to feed your eyeballs on. But we're not to love the pleasures of this world. These picture shows, that uh, X-rated stuff, those televisions and I'm glad whoever named it VCR knew what they was calling it means very closely related to the television whoever concocted that phrase but I'm saying this the rottenness that boils up out of that television and of the VCR in the movie theater is not fit for human consumption let alone Christians eyes amen and if you are watching it you have got very little sense amen I wouldn't be so unkind as to call you an idiot but you're close to it if you want to have God the power of God and the blessings of God on your life you can't watch that hellish mess You may, I don't know what is going on in our Baptist churches, but our Baptist people are theater managers. 
When you got a VCR, you are a, you are a theater manager. You're managing what's going on in that VCR. That's good for you to find doing. He said that, I know somebody said, you're preaching on things. This is that strange. First John said, love not the world, neither the things, the things, the things that are in the world. Amen. Talking about things. We're talking about picture shows right now. I say this is the lust of the eye. We're talking about pornography now. That's about as rotten as anything ever has been, could be, and is right now. You can't, I mean, there's no way that any man, I don't know about women, they're different. I wouldn't suggest you'd want to look at it either, but I'm saying men cannot watch or look at pornography. They can't do it. You say, well, that doesn't bother me. You're crazy. You know you're sick. You are sick. You need to see a doctor, somebody. I'm serious about that. I'll just hurry because I'll never get done before dinner and I'm hungry as you are. But there's, we're talking about the lust of the eye. Now we're talking about, these all start with P. There's the picture shows and the pornography. And the parade of display of nakedness. If you want to lust, there's plenty of places to lust. All you got to go is to the local mall. Or just downtown on the streets, amen. And I'm saying, I'm getting there. Then there's that, the publications. The eye gate cannot handle for a child of God. It is so unchristian for you to read these worldly novels that are written. You'd be surprised the people that are sitting right in this room this morning that buy and read and get from the library hell-bound idiot stuff. You, I'm talking about weights now. That so doth easily beset you. We're talking about uh, publications that so many of you are reading. Now, now that's not Christian for you to do so. There are some Christian novels you could read, but you even have to be careful about some of them. They slip off once in a while too. Amen. We're talking about for all these peas. We're talking about the public bathing beach. I don't know how it is down south up in Yankee there's hardly anybody preaches against that kind of stuff it's it's just about like preachers down here they don't preach against cigarettes up there they don't preach against mixed bathing but I say it's things that you want to get rid of these weights talking about the permissive Christians that wear things to church to the house of God my gracious, it startles and shocks me. I, I've got false teeth. I almost dropped my teeth last Sunday. I mean, a woman came forward during the invitation. Whew! Good night. I, mean, I didn't see her come in. It's too bad some woman didn't throw a blanket over her before she got to the altar. <coughs> You say it wouldn't be in our church. Well, friend, it just happens. And I preach against such stuff, but I want to tell you, in most of these Baptist churches, these girls run up and down these aisles with, with, with slits in their skirts and showing off their underwear. I don't know what you're advertising. Amen. You say, well, you can't buy dresses without slits. You can sew them up. Bless God. You may think it's cute and you may think it's stylish, but it's wicked as hell is what it is. You hear these men saying amen, don't you? Because men can't stand to see a lady's petticoat without it bothering them in some way or another. You want to show off your underwear? Wear it on the outside, amen. Talking about permissive Christians. Talking about uh, the privacy of our own home. I, I was shocked the other day. One of the main members of my church. I mean, I love this family. They're their dearest people to me. I, well, I don't know how I get along without them. They're just that precious. 
And I went to their home the other day and every one of them was in Bermudas. He said, oh, no, no, bless God, that's, that's not Christian. He said, well, I am. You're not too Christian. See, you you make me mad, Brother Good. I don't even intend to make you mad. I love you. I just say you got some weights that are besetting you. You know, just really, just to be honest about it, you. I, one of my girls, precious girl. I mean, she goes to Bob Jones University, can't hardly. I mean, they got good standard. But she came home, and I noticed her the other day. Uh, she was in one of these sweatpants. Now, we don't wear pants. Girls don't wear pants at our place. But I guess there's something good between pants and sweatpants. Uh, some fellow, some preacher friend of mine said that he's going to, if he sees any of his members in sweatpants, he's going to send their membership over to the health spa. <laughs> It is wicked. Now that's all there is to it. It's too revealing. It is too revealing. So I think it covered. You don't know. Your brain's not working just right. Amen. I know I'm upsetting two or three of you a half a dozen. I mean, but I just got a divorce from public opinion, and it helps me ever so much. It goes for the, the, the uh, shorts and the sundresses. And, the, and I haven't made up my mind about these jams, but that's something else, isn't it? Yeah. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I hope you never find out. Amen. <laughs> but the lust of the eye, it can be an awful heavy weight. That's why good preachers, I'm saying good preachers, uncompromising preachers, preach against punk rock, preach against pornography they preach against petting they preach against the picture shows they preach against pants on women and they preach against this parade of nakedness they preach against the publication of these bad books you say boy you know Mike you don't have anybody at your church we got a wonderful church we got a wonderful church. I dare say there isn't a church like it a hundred miles around there. Old-fashioned, Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled power moves in. Last Sunday morning, I never even got to preach and people fill the altar three times. So I don't agree with that kind of stuff. You're wrong and I'm right. Amen. Now the works. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery. This is what the flesh will produce. Adultery. This is Galatians 5. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hated, hatred, variance, emulation. That's uh, trying to emulate, trying to imitate. It's a strange thing. Our precious young people emulate the stupidest people in the world. A lot of them look like Halloween 20... Well, they look like Halloween 52 weeks out of the year. Somebody's well said, our young people, they don't wear clothes, they wear costumes. Try to look like somebody else. Why don't you just look like yourself, amen? Emulations and wrath and strife and sedition and heresies and endings and drunkenness and, and reveling and such like. That's partying, that's carousing, that's fooling around. What well. These weights that does so easily beset us. Three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That speaks of self-righteousness and position seekers and power-hungry folks and riches and attention seekers and show-offs. That isn't Christian to be a show-off. Glorying in the vanity of life and worldly pleasures. No wonder Paul said, he said, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And ye shall be, and I shall be father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. Now, I say I'm not trying to be super spiritual or, or funny or clown or something like that. And again, I say, you say, well, 
You don't have very many in your church. I don't have, I compared to some of you, I'm a punk, I suppose. Well, we, we'll run 400 in Sunday school. I'm not too bad for a guy that preaches like I preach. My wife said, Don, she said, if you would just stop preaching against television and women wearing britches, you would run a thousand in Sunday school in just a matter of a few weeks. I don't think it's worth it. She wasn't telling me to do it. She was just telling me that that would happen. We're talking about worldliness. We're talking about the W. Now that's just my first point. You can see we'll get through about 3 o'clock this afternoon. But we will, I'll hurry right along and I'll get down to where I think I've got to be and then I'll just, it's 12 o'clock, usually at 12. I'll, I, won't be, I won't be long, really. The second, the second is, the E stands for envious covetousness. Now I put the envious covetousness because it's all right to covet the best gifts, to covet spiritual things, but when you endlessly covet, God absolutely forbids covetousness. The tenth commandment is, Thou shalt not covet. No one can ever be used of God that has covetousness in your life. You say, I don't know. Well, I'll tell you why. That's a weight. It's such a weight that God, when He set up the schedule of Old Testament values, and when He was instructing Israel who to set as rulers of their people. He said these words, Exodus 21, 1821, Moreover thou shalt provide out of the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such of them to be rulers over thousands, over hundreds, over fifties, and over tens. Otherwise, the qualification of an Old Testament ruler was you couldn't be covetous. The qualification in the New Testament for a pastor in Titus 3 and 3 is not given to wine, nor striker, nor greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, a, a, not a brawler, not covetous. Amen. Did you ever wonder why you have never been greatly used of God? Could it be that you have been disqualified because of covetousness? Yeah. I want to tell you something about the television. Just how do you work that in? I think that television is the most productive yeah. business of covetousness that's ever been. You constantly seeing things on there you want. And sometimes you even see somebody else's wife you might want. Or some other's lifestyle that you may want. And you start coveting after those things that you ought never to be even thinking about as a child of God. Really, covetousness is so wicked it damns souls. Ephesians 5 and 5, For this we know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. You see, covetous has to be uprooted by the roots out of your heart. Mortified and put to death. Colossians 3, 5, Mortify therefore your members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, in order and affection, evil, concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. God says that covetousness is idolatry. Oh, that is a strong statement. You see, covetousness breeds greed and murder. It breeds rebellion and oppression and violence and denial of God and injustice and backsliding and deception and defilement and temptations and lust. And a short life and a fool's end is what covetous will do. Look at the examples in the Bible. Now, not preach, but I just give you them. Eve coveted after that forbidden fruit. Lot after those lands. Jacob after the birthright. Balaam after rewards. Achan after money. And Babylonish garments. 
those worldly garments, those worldly clothes. And uh, David uh, coveted after that woman. And Ahab after Naboth's vineyard. And Gehazi after the gifts. And the rich young fool after security. And Judas after silver. And the Pharisees after riches. And Simon the sorcerer uh, after the power of God. And, um, and Festus after financial gain. And Demas he coveted after pleasure. I'm trying to tell you something this morning. That covetousness is idolatry. It is wicked. Now you can, I'll tell you what money can buy. Money can buy a bed, but it can't buy sleep. Money can buy books, but it can't buy brains. Money can buy food, but it can't buy an appetite. Money can buy finery, but it can't buy beauty. Money can buy a house, but money can't buy a home. Money can buy medicine, but it can't buy health. Money can buy luxuries, but it can't buy culture. Money can buy amusement, but money can't buy really happiness. Money can buy a crucifix, but it can't buy a savior. Money can buy a church pew, but it can't buy heaven. I tell you, there is a great deal of deceitfulness about riches. And I'm saying to you this morning, and I trust that you'd understand that this business of covetousness, this evil, this evil, uh, envious covetousness is a terrible weight. I know it's so hard for you to see your own covetousness, but if you would stack it up against the Word of God and your desires, you'd rid that stuff out of your heart and get on the mission field or get serving God, but you're so greedy and so anxious to get some more of this worldly goods that you could if you wanted to, like the dear brother said last night, you ladies could stay at home and take care of your own kids if you wasn't so covetous. And some of you men would have to go on the backbone and sand in your pants to take a stand at the house to see that the old lady did stay to home. You kind of like it because you like the money that's coming in and I think you're a wimp. I say it again, I think you're a wimp. You say, you couldn't, you couldn't pastor a church. I'm, well, God, people love me. They don't even want me to go away. Say, they must be sick right along with you. How they like me. I'll just go to the next I. The I is the weight of worldliness and covetousness. And the third one is insubordination. That's rebellion. That's a weight. That's defiance and any kind of control upon your life. There was a death penalty in the Old Testament for anybody that was rebellious. Am I telling the right about that? Uh, you can look it up. I haven't got time in Numbers 15, 30, and 31. The death penalty. God will not tolerate rebellion. He said, I will ascend. I will exalt. I will set. I will be like the most high God. And when anybody rebels, God looks at it as you are acting just like the devil. When you rebel, you are acting like the devil. For he's the father of all rebellion. To God, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Rebellion is resisting God's word. It's resisting God's will and God's wisdom and God's way and God's work. It's resisting the way of holiness. It's resisting the way of God's power. It's resisting the way of being used of God. Rebellion. Rebellion. I'll tell you what self-control is. To keep you from rebellion is instant obedience to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The moment God says, don't you touch that, say, yes, Lord, I won't touch it. Don't you go there. All right, Lord, if you don't want me to go, I won't go. Don't you read that. All right, Lord, if you don't want me to read it, I won't read it. Don't you ever say that again. All right, Lord, I'll not say that again. 
You just go right ahead against the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, friend, you are a rebellious person. I don't know how you operate, but I know the Holy Ghost lives inside of me. And I can't, after I got saved, I could never sin again after I got saved and enjoy it. Every time I ever have sinned since I got saved, there's something hurts right down here in my heart. Do you ever feel that down in your heart hurt when you do something wrong? Let me see your hand. Sure you do. So I never feel anything like that. You're probably lost. You, if you're saved, Holy Ghost will set up a guard and he'll say, you can't, you can't do that. Now you can grieve and quench and smother the Spirit of God until after a while you get cast, kind of seared conscience and go ahead and do it anyway. But that's rebellion against God. And rebellion shuts the doors. Obedience opens doors. Rebellion cuts off blessings. But obedience brings big blessings into your home. God wants to bless you. But in subordination, your rebellion cuts off God. God says, go, and you say, no. Boy, if I, if I had the time, I would take and give you a lesson down through the life of the book of Jonah on rebellion. But Jonah, God said, go. Jonah said, no. And he went, he had learned after a while that God hadn't changed his mind about anything at all. And that if he was going to get in God's will, he was going to have to obey God's word and get to where he was supposed to go. And he didn't go. He took another trip. But he got in a whale of a lot of trouble too, didn't he? But God finally taught him the lesson that the only way revival could come in his life and those Ninevites was for him to obey the word of God which he finally got to where he was supposed to go and God blessed it. Amen. Amen. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You see, how can you tell rebellious? How if I was rebellious? Uh, first of all, I can see it. You pardon me. Don't be offended with me. And Brother Allen, don't be offended with me what I'm going to say. But you can tell rebellion on the countenance of people. This long hair, I've seen it on some of you fellas here this week. That's rebellion. So I don't think it is. It is rebellion. It is rebellion. It's, just, it's contrary to the Word of God. It's lining your life up with those people of this world that wear long hair. And that is a badge of their rebellion. You say, well, I'm not rebellious. Then cut your hair. I tell you how you can spot rebellion. It shows up in your countenance. It shows up in your clothes. Your clothes will tell you just about what you are. Now, I'm not talking about fancy clothes. I'm not talking about... I'm just talking about the way you wear your clothes. Just about tell what strata of life you're living in and what kind of attitude you have towards God. Your companions will pretty well tell me how much rebellion's in you too. You travel around with a wicked, ungodly, rebellious bunch. Tell me who your friends are, I'll tell you who you are. Amen. There's something else that kind of reveal your rebellion, that's your conversation. And your conduct. And your composure. They see it on your face. And your concern for spiritual things. You can tell whether you'd like to go to church or not. Whether you like to read your Bible or not. Whether you like to pray or not. Whether you like to win souls or not. Whether you like to be faithful or not. That kind of tells. It's quiet and right down. Real good right now. That's how you tell whether there's rebellion. And rebellion is a weight. The G stands. The G stands for a grudge, or grudging, or holding a grudge, or having an unforgiven spirit. That's a weight. Hebrews twelve fifteen. Look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness 
springing up trouble you, thereby many be defiled. But the principle that he said, for if men forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. If you got some grudge against somebody else in the connotation of Jesus' teaching, he said, you will not be forgiven. If you got something on against your brother, go first to thy brother and then go to the altar. You cannot fall out uh, with man without falling out with God. You fall out with God, you fall out with somebody else. I'm saying to you that bitterness defiles. And I realize, brother, there are people in this world that I care little or nothing about. I have a battle. Ooh, do I have a battle? There are some people that crisscross my wires and just burn out my fuses. I just can't hardly stand them. You so say, I'm not like that. You're so much wonderful. I, I should like to meet you after church. You're so wonderful. We all have that. I have to pray. I have to pray four or five times a day for God to put a right spirit in my heart about certain things. Oh, that's the truth. I'm telling the right. And there are people's personalities that I just don't go down the drain with me too well. And then there are some personal feelings. You know, people, they get ideas that, you know, they kind of hold it against God for the, their looks. I mean, they don't look as good as they'd like to. Maybe they don't have as much mentality as others. And they hold that against God. Or maybe some physical, you're crippled, or maybe you're sickly. Or maybe some financial just I don't understand God. Why do I have to go through all I'm going through? It's easy to get bitter over some personal feelings that you have in your heart. Or over perhaps some prejudices. I'm telling you, prejudices is bad business. It'll hurt. It'll it's a weight. I mean, it's a weight. You're not going to get anywhere with God. And I'm not trying to be smart or super spiritual. I'm just telling you, if this preacher has any battle, anywhere to stay close to God, it's right here in this area, right here. It's a battle, brother. I just reveal my heart to you. That old bitterness will defile you. It will wreck and eat your lunch and just take away all the joy that there is in this life. I don't know where I am now. I lost my place. But we're in the next one and the fifth one. And I, that's the H. That stands for hurtful criticism. I'm talking about things that are weights. You cannot criticize, lambaste your brother or sister and have God's power and blessings on your life. Now, I know it's getting lunchtime and you're getting weary with all this. And I'll not, I just want to just give you this little, this is a nice little poem. I'll just give you a little poem to put you to sleep now. Just rock a bye, baby, to go right on. Don't uh, pray, pray, don't find fault with a man who limps or stumbles along the road. Unless you have worn the shoes that he wears or struggle beneath his load. There may be tacks in his shoes that hurt, though hidden away from view. Or the burden he bears placed on your back might make you stumble too. Don't, uh, don't sneer at the man who is down today unless you have felt the blow that caused his fall or felt the shame that only the fallen know. You may be strong, but still the blows that were his, if dealt to you, in the self-same way, at the self-same time, might cause you to stagger too. Don't be too harsh with a man who sins and pelt him with words or stones, unless you are sure, yes, doubly sure, that you have not sins of your own. For you know, perhaps, if the tempter's voice should whisper as soft to you as it did to him when he went astray to it cause you to falter too. I tell you this criticism really is a weight. 
Pastor, we've got a lot to criticize, boy. I want to tell you, you are some punkin. I mean, you're a great Christian. I mean, you're so wonderful. You have all the characteristics you ought to have. And you have arrived at perfection. So you've got every right to criticize everybody else. See how, see how wicked it is? You haven't got any right to do that. It makes you small is what it does. But while it's making you small, it makes others fall. And it makes the church stall. And it makes the church covenant null. I say null. We're to support one another according to church covenant. Amen. Amen. And it makes the devil have a ball. And it takes a lot of gall for you to criticize somebody else. But the biggest thing about it, it builds a wall. Yes, sir. I tell you, criticism, criticism pulls down. It breaks up homes. Goodness, I had a precious, a real precious young man and his wife in our church. And my wife and I had him over for dinner the other night just to kind of encourage them because they're about ready to break up. I mean, their home's about ready to go. And, and boy, they're precious. And their families, both of their families. I mean, their the, families are the best people in my church. And these two kids have been married. I don't know. They got three kids. But she's gone to work. And she said, no, Brother Green, don't tell me that I can't work. Because I just, I love to go to work. Because when I get to work and I do a good job, my boss says, Debbie, you sure have done wonderful around this office. And he loud us say, Debbie, you sure are cute. She said, I never hear any good words from my husband. So she's out somewhere else to find some gratification. Now you ought to wake up. You ought to wake up. You can criticize, criticize, find fault with that maid of yours. Criticize your child. Keep on criticizing. He said, you're so stupid. You're so dumb. You'll never learn. And he won't. You could encourage him. Amen. Criticism really destroys it, it breaks up homes, it breaks up churches, it breaks up friendships, it breaks up unity, the power of God and revival. It breaks up the work of God. It'll destroy you. It's a weight. It is a terrible weight. I, uh, I not read it, but there's a wonderful verse of scripture there in Matthew 7. Judge not lest you be judged. That's a precious portion of the word of God. Let me go to the next one I'm trying to get through so that you won't miss too much of your lunch. And that's the letter T of my weights. And I call that taking the glory. You could call it touching the glory. That's a weight. Diotrephes there in 2 John verse 9. He said, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes who loved to have the preeminence among them received us not. I see many would like to serve the Lord if, if they could be the first, if they could be the pastor or they could be the deacon, or they could be the Sunday school superintendent, or they could um, sing the solo in the choir, they'd be all right. Or if they could somehow or other get some praise and be a big shot in the church. I tell you, friend, you're never going to get anywhere with God if you touch the glory. You just don't touch the glory. Let God have all the glory. He used to be a dear friend of mine, a preacher, an old preacher. He's just about dead now. He's just about gone. Old Dr. Fred Garland. Old Fred used to say, Don, stay in the dust. Stay in the dust. I say, if you want God, stay in the dust. Don't lift your head up. Take any praise. Give all the glory to God. That's where the power comes in. You jockey for position and you fish for compliments. You know how to fish for compliments. Anybody been around this business long enough, you can fish for them. You want somebody to say, that was a good sermon, Brother Green. All you guys say, well, we had a wonderful service tonight. Yeah, that was a good sermon, Brother Green. You just kind of lose a little something inside. The glow goes off. Amen. 
You're just waiting for that preacher to pat you on the back or somebody say some nice words about you. And you look just a little bit stiffy. You just like to have some compliments. You sure are pretty today. You like that. Watch out now. You watch out. Amen. You're heading for some problems in your life. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. John said he must increase. I must decrease. I'll ask you a question. Write it down. How are you getting along with your decreasing? Everybody wants to know how you get along with your increasing. How you get along with your decreasing? Are you trying to get down a little bit? Are you trying to get lower? I'm not trying to be super spiritual. I wouldn't do that for anything. I'm just trying to help somebody who wants to have God and the power of God in their life every day. And I know it's not important, but it's important for me. Every day, at least twice every day, sometimes many more times, I find a place where I can get down on my face and lay on my stomach and put my nose to the floor and say, God, I want you to know, Don Green, it's not running this outfit. That's down. Stay down in the dust. You're not all that you think you could be. You're not all that hot shot. This is what the Bible says. This is what God said about that. Proverbs 16 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. That's strong medicine, isn't it? He said, Lunch is not ready, but I'm about ready. I just want to give this last thought, and I'm done. And, and that has to do with skepticism. That's the stone. That is, that is one of those weights. God can't really demonstrate his power when there's no faith. Jesus himself, in his own hometown of Nazareth, couldn't demonstrate the power of God. He said he did not many, many mighty works there because of their unbelief. There's just no telling what God could do with an individual, absolutely, who wouldn't doubt, who would believe God. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto the mountain, remove hence unto yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible for you. According to your faith, so shall it be done unto you. I could say it, I could stand upon the rooftop of this tabernacle and shout it. He is everything he claims to be and more. I have never, ever prayed one prayer in my life. But when I really meant it, God has always heard me. He's that kind of a God. When I really exercise faith, Joshua said, There fail not aught of any good thing which the Lord has spoken unto the house of Israel. All of it came to pass. You know, John Wesley has been recognized. He's a, he's a founder of the Methodist Church. And uh, they're modernistic today. But John was far from modernistic. Uh, John was a great man. John said these words. Would you listen if you didn't hear anything else I said this morning? I want to tell you how prayer works. How it gets things done. Just this is why. You say, I don't understand prayer. Let me just show you what John Wesley said. <clears throat> he said this is a practical, practicality of prayer. God does nothing except an answer to prayer. John said that. He said God accommodates himself in answer to prayer. He said that God works on our free will. You move, and then God moves. He said this, draw nigh to God, that's your move. Then God will draw nigh to you, that's your move. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, that's your move. Then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. Yes, sir. That's God's move. That's you find everywhere you find prayer in the Bible. That's the principle of prayer. 
If ye shall ask anything in my name, that's your move. The Father will be glorified in the Son. If ye ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's, that's the practicality of it. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask in the Father's name, he'll give it you. Here do you have asked nothing in my name, ask and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. God does nothing with the exception answer to prayer. You want something done? Pray. These are weights, and I've given you seven weights. What I want to say to you is this. If you'll take these seven things and consider them as weights in your life, would you, by the grace of God, I could, you could do as you please. It's not going to bother me a bit in the world. There's no skin off of my nose. It's not going to make a flip of difference to me, whether you do or you don't. But I've told you this morning, I went for from the time I was nine years of age until I was 26 years of age and I resisted God I was saved, saved, saved but I was had a saved soul but I had a lost life yes. Yes, sir. and until, listen Jesus said these words if you'll save your life you'll lose it if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. If you save your life for your own comfort, for what you want to do, for what you want to be, for the way you want to wear your hair, for the way you want to wear your clothes, for what you want to go and what you want to be, what you want to say, if you save yourself for yourself, you'll lose your life. It'll soon be gone. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. You can lose your life by saving it for yourself. But if you'll give your life, lose your life, lose your life for the cause of Christ, you'll save it. You'll have something to lay down at his feet. Don't be selfish. You don't even belong to yourself. You belong to God. He ought not to have to beg you to give what belongs to him. He wants you to give your life lock, stock, barrel, deep, totally, unconditionally to him. Let's stand together. I think it'd be wonderful to see old time Holy Ghost spirit filled devil killing revival.